All right, thank you. This is um, beginning Viking food. So um, we're going to take this from if you know nothing about the subject at all. Um, so we're gonna start out. Uh, the Viking Age is roughly from around 750 to around 1050-ish. There is discussion on whether or not we're going to change that depending on when you decided that the Viking Age started. Um, but 750 to 1050 is, is, is solid and easy to remember. And then you have the Viking Age as a time period. And then the Viking area is the area of influence of the Scandinavian culture. So Viking culture originated in Denmark, Sweden, and Norway, and then spread from there. So during the Viking Age, your Viking culture goes over east into the Balkans, um, all the way down through Russia. You have a little bit of influence that rubs up against the Middle East, which is a really, really, really strong culture. And cultures push against each other. And so the Viking culture came down and then would push against there. And then you'd have that mix in the middle. Uh, their culture also spread out through the British Isles through parts of France and then over into Iceland and Greenland and for a little tiny bit into Newfoundland. And that, that settlement didn't work out for, for some reasons and we're not quite sure why. Uh, and then what you get with your Viking Age food is you will have different things being made in southern Sweden, then you would be having made in northern Norway, and then there you have a completely, well not completely, but like 25% difference when you start getting over into Ireland or into the British Isles or down in France, and then Iceland. Iceland is its own little island, um, and things get weird there because it's an island and it's Iceland. So we're going to be going over mostly what is going on actually on in southern Sweden and Denmark and, and Norway, just to tighten it down a little bit and make it easier to, to look at the cuisine because it just, it's spread a lot. Um, Vikings had a very, very tasty culture. And during that period of time, most of Europe had a much, much weaker culture and so that spread happened. Um, things that we know. Um, Vikings were Vikings were really, really bad at writing things down. Um, we have we have the sagas, uh, the Icelandic sagas, and those were actually written about 200 years after the fact based on oral traditions. And the oral traditions are skaldic poetry. Skaldic poetry has very, very, very intense rules. And so what you ended up with was a fairly good 200 years of oral tradition and it not being too much playing telephone. Um, it's hard to screw up a skaldic poem because if you screw it up, it's not going to fit the rules and then it's not gonna be a proper poem. So we have, what is written down in the sagas. And there were some other works that were written. There was a huge fire in Copenhagen in the 1700s and it burned a lot of, of runic writings. And so we just, we don't have a lot that's actually written down. So the biggest thing that we have that we can look at in order to find out what these people ate is looking at the actual archeology. span um, you're looking at, at garbage heaps, um, what's left over from that. You're looking at the cooking implements that, that are left over. Uh, you're looking at grave finds and what people ended up with being buried with. Um, there's a couple of places where there would be like a disaster and then there was a pretty good preservation of what their day-to-day -day life looked like. Um, you're looking at the remains of their toilets to see what people ate 
before they went there. Um, and, and that gives us kind of an idea on what our ingredients look like. Um, the other thing you have to look at is, is like outside of the Viking Age, when people did start writing more down, you can, you can look at some of the first writings and what, what people were eating then and what they were putting together and what was considered to be um, old traditional food at that time. If you're looking at something that was a traditional food, but it's 200 years after what you're looking at, it's not going to be exact. Um, but food traditions have a tendency to change slower than many other traditions, just based on, on comfort. People crave what they had when they were a child. And what you have as a child is then what you're going to feed your children. And then you get cultural pride from your food. And so food culture is one of the slower things to change. You will get added in things and large traumatic events will, will change food culture quickly. But if there's no reason to, then your, your food culture tends to say barely stagnant um, compared to the rest of society. Um, then you're looking at, at just the remains. Um, you're looking at the bodies of people that have died. You're doing analysis on the bones. Um, one of the easy things that you can tell from that is kind of how much seafood people ate versus how much land food you ate. Uh, the carbon that is in the ocean is older carbon than the ocean, than the carbon that's on the land. Um, one of the best examples of this is the large Viking army was wiped out in, in, on the British Isles. And they did find a whole large mass grave that matched up perfectly. It, it should be this invasion. And we know the invasion happened because that's, that's written down. Um, the analysis on the bones though, was that they were 50 years too old to be that army. And further analysis now has shown that that, that is the correct army. Those are the correct bones. They just look to be 50 years older because those people whose skeletons they were looking at were eating about 40% of their caloric intake of seafood, just massive amounts of seafood. And that's, that's going to be that Fisker. Um, just, they ate a lot of fish, um, just a ridiculous amount of fish. And, and that was, that was the traveling warrior class. So that may just be them. Um, but Everywhere that Viking culture moved to, the consumption of fish went up. Um, in Jorvik, after Jorvik is, is York, which is in the London area, and the Vikings ruled it for many, many years. And after, after they left, the consumption of, of fish plummeted um, just because you did not want to be seen eating. The, the food of the conquerors. This was now a new culture. This is new people. You don't eat that stuff that those people ate. Um, do, do we have any questions just on that before we move on to, to actual ingredients? Well, for one thing, York <laughs> is not near London. It is landlocked and up north. Yeah, that, yeah, it's, it's nearer to London than it is to Copenhagen. Um, that's. I'd have to sit and figure that out. It may not be. <laughs> Anyhow, okay. Sony, um, there's three chat questions actually. Okay. Carmen. Um, what do we have? Um, so I'm sorry, I'm jumping in here to help. Um, yeah, I was, I was getting there. Okay, well, is, is there a word for Viking slash Scandinavian culture after 1050? Um, there is not a word that I, that I know, because then you, you end up with, with the Danes, you end up with the Swedes and they became more of a, a part of, of the greater European culture. Um, as they became Christian, they became more Christian, they became more monarchy. Um, and that feudal society 
developed um, that they did not have before. Um, that's also beyond what I what I do a lot of study on. Okay, next question. Did they check the nitrogen isotopes to back up the fish consumption? I am assuming they do. Um, I would have to go back and read that study again in order to find out. And uh, then some smarty party says, so you're saying there's something fishy about the bone analysis. <laughs> yes. yes, there is. Very fishy. Okay, now we're going to go back. Into, yeah, okay, we're going to go back into um, ingredients that that you can use when you're doing Viking Age food. Um, primarily, um, the first thing to, to to look at is seafood. Um, they ate a lot of seafood. Um, you could dry the seafood. Um, hard fisker is just um, it's just fish that has been hung outside to dry. You don't do anything to it. You just you, you, you gut it and you hang it by the tail from stocks. Um, stocks are basically just an A-frame and it sits in the wind. There's, you cannot do this everywhere in Scandinavia. Um, along the, the Faroe Islands, you can do it. You can do it in Iceland. You can do it in a large swath of Norway, but you need to have the perfect conditions where it's windy it's dry, it's cold, but it's not freezing. Because if your fish freezes, it's not gonna, it's not gonna be proper. Um, this was a huge trade good and they ate a lot of it. Um, the next thing you have is, is dairy. Uh, dairy was very important. Um, you had sheep dairy, you had cow dairy, and you had goat dairy. Most of it was probably not drunk like milk, that was probably fairly uncommon. You would, well, you would milk your cow or your goat or your sheep, um, wait, skim off the, the cream. That will leave you with about 2% milk. And then you would ferment that into skier, or you would put in a, a rennet or another coagulant and turn that into cheese and store that, take the whey that's left off over from that and use that whey for either a drink, um, allow it to ferment some more so that you get the acidity up and you can use that for pickling um, or you can use it to basically instead of broth in order to make soups, stews and, and porridges. Um, land meats, they raised a, a lot of animals. Uh, pigs are kind of my nemesis and most settlements had pigs Pigs, you can, you can feed anything to pigs. And that's why they're kind of my nemesis. They, they skew the bone finds towards cattle and horses because uh, anything smaller than that, the pigs will eat. If you boil sheep bones down in order to make stock out of them and get all of the nutrients out of those, um, they become soft enough that a pig can eat pretty much the entire sheep or pig or goat or all of those little fish bones. They they ate those too. Um, and so where you have pigs, you get this weird skewing of your, of your record. Um, vegetables, they grew a lot of brassicas. So early forms of cabbage. So think like cabbage and kale. Um, there were alliums of some sort. So onions, leeks, the, the hard part with, with onions and, and leeks, and they definitely had ramsons, but they kind of show up in the, in the springtime. They're kind of like a wild garlic, but they don't preserve very well. Um, we do know that they had some kinds of onions, but if you take a leek and you throw it outside, um, like an onion leek, not the other kind, um, and then you wait a thousand years, there's just nothing left. And so we don't have a, a lot of, evidence on exactly what kinds they had. Um, you also had your root vegetables. There would be some, some sea beets, possibly more bulby beets, not quite sure. Um, turnips of some sort, not sure when they got Swedes showed up. Um, Swedes are a mix of, of turnip and, and beets and showed up at some point and were common enough that they just call them Swedes. You would get your fruits and your nuts, you know, um, a lot of hazelnuts and berries. Uh, berries would be gathered, they wouldn't actually be grown. 
and then cherries, um, sweet cherries were the kind of cherries you got up north. Um, sour cherries were, were from the Middle East. And then your gathering of things that weren't actually grown on purpose was mostly your berries, um, dulse, which is, which is seaweed and wild greens. So wild greens would be, uh, well, the ones we can get around here that are really easy, like cat's ear and dandelion um, grow all over the place. Um, Goosefoot um, grows in many areas of our, of our known world as well. And they make wonderful greens. Um, do we have any other questions on, on, on this little part? I'm trying to keep up on them. I'll skip over that. We're going to go straight to implement. Um, oh, wait, I had one quick question. Sorry. Oh, yep. Um, for just knowing what they ate, have they done any like chemical analysis after finding pot shards and scraping them to kind of try to figure out what was cooked in in like cooking pottery? Um, they have, and we'll we'll get to that more in the advanced class. Um, we're just going over what they have here. And then in the advanced class, we'll go over more of how we know that they have it. So going with the cooking things that you would be able to do this, this check with. Um, so there's a lot of finds of, of actually actual cooking implements. So we have a fair idea of what people were using to cook the food with. And then from that, we need to figure out how they actually cooked it. So um, fairly common were, were iron pots that were riveted. Um, there are many, many finds of these. They're in various sizes. There's smaller ones. Um, they would hold like a couple of quarts um, all the way up to the larger ones, um, the Osberg ship burial had one that holds about about seven and a half gallons. Um, it's, it holds more than it looks like. I have a replica and it, it's huge. Um, you can feed 50 people out of the one pot. Uh, they also did a lot of soapstone pots. Um, soapstone is, is fairly common and they mined that. And the places where you mined soapstone were very valuable. Um, there were there were skirmishes and small wars fought over soapstone mines. Um, you can see where they were mining the soapstone because the, they would mine it out in the, the shape of what they were making. And so you have these, these divots um, in the soapstone giving you kind of an idea on the size of the pots. And also soapstone preserves fairly well. So we have existent um, replicas or not replicas, but actual examples of, of the soapstone pots. Uh, they are smaller than the big iron pots and they cook a little differently because uh, that soapstone heats up and it holds its heat really well. Um, they're fantastic. They were also repaired, uh, which tells you a bit about how valuable they were because you, if you broke your soapstone pot, you would get somebody to make basically staples out of iron and you would staple it back together. The iron heats up, you put it together, put the staples in and then the iron cools and it really holds the pot together. They, they repaired quite well. Um, we also have the spoons. Um, Vikings ate with, with spoons and with fingers. That's, that's an easy way to find out if your food is appropriate, if you can eat it with your fingers or you can eat it with a spoon. That is, that is something that the Vikings were going to have. Um, they did not eat with forks. Um, they did not eat with the popular little pokey sticks that people sell as, as Viking pokey tools. Um, there's, there's no evidence that pokey sticks were, were a thing that, that Vikings used, um, especially metal pokey sticks. Um, you would usually eat out of a bowl or, or like a trough. There are a lot of examples of, of wooden, wooden troughs and bowls 
Uh, wood does not hold up really well. And if you break your bowl, um, there's a really easy way to recycle it called um, fuel. And so we don't have as much evidence of, of bowls and, and just serving utensils as, as I would like because a lot of it appears to be made of wood. Um, they did have some clay pots. They were, they were not a really big pottery culture. Um, a lot of the rest of the world used much, much, much more pottery um, than the Scandinavian Viking culture. Their, their clay was, their clay was much inferior to, to soapstone and they had the access to soapstone. So they used what was better. Um, a lot of the clay finds that we find in later Viking period settlements are actually imports um, when they were bringing in wine as they, they loved wine, but they didn't make it, they, they imported it. And then you have the, the shards from that. Um, so you would have your big pots and then your cooking implement would be a fire and your fire was usually on the ground. Um, it was in the cooking area of your house and then you would, you would hang on chains, your, your various pots. Those chains themselves are, are part of your cooking ware and they were sometimes quite ornate and expensive. And so that would be how you would do your heat variants or if you just wanted something to simmer or if you wanted to drop it down. Um, I have not played enough with, with cooking chains, but I think that they are more important than um, anybody is looking at just because they're really hard to make and they're, they're really expensive because they're made out of iron and somebody that knows what they're doing has to make them. And so there has to be a reason why you would use that other than a piece of rope when a piece of rope will do almost everything that a cooking chain will do. Um, cooking stones were another thing that you would use. There's two kinds of cooking stones. There's stones that you would heat up and then you would put into a barrel or you would put into a pot in order to heat up your liquid. Um, this was used a lot if you're making something really, really, really big um, or if you're brewing beer and you needed to heat up a large amount of, of liquid, um, you would use hot stones and then take the stones back out, heat them back up, put them back in. They, you can keep reusing them until they break. There's a lot of evidence of where they threw the broken stones. So we know they're using those. Then around your hearth, you would have larger flat stones that would heat up from the fire. And you could use those to bake things on. You could grill things. Um, you could cook fish on those. Probably flatbreads were cooked on those. Um, that was... That and your, and your pots are your two main way that you're cooking food. There were little flat pans about, about yay big, not terribly large with a long handle. Um, many of those are found. There's this weird swirly thing. Um, it's not very big. It's only about yay big. And there are not very many of those. I don't know if that was a custom job or somebody specifically wanted that it's it's a really popular thing to find and there are probably more of them at use right now in the SCA than were ever used in the Viking age um, and we're, we're not sure what those are for um, spits are another thing they cook on um, a Viking spit kind of looks like a spear so it's just a stick with a pokey on the end of it and then um, something to keep your whatever you put on that um, spit from sliding down. So this was not the kind of spit that you would put over the fire and then slowly turn. This was the kind of spit that you would have to hold on to one end the whole time and, and turn it yourself. So this gets us to our, our various techniques in which we're going to be making some Viking food. And eventually we'll get to actually what you can make with your Viking food. But you have to have your ingredients first and then how you're gonna do it. So your, your number one way that um, people during the Viking age made their food was, was boiling or simmering. So you would take a pot, you would put some liquid into it, you would put other stuff into it and then you put it over the fire 
and you make yourself some food. Um, usually you wouldn't want that like really boiling, 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 boiling. That's that makes bad food. Um, pulls everything out, uses too much energy for your, for your heat. Um, there's a lot you can do with a slow simmer to make really, really good food. Your second form would be that stone baking. So you have around your fire, you have those, those stones that are gonna be hot. Um, they give you a fairly even heat and there's a lot that you can cook on those stones. Um, obviously you wouldn't put anything liquidy on it. It would run off. Um, but if you were cooking a, a bread, you could put that on those and they would cook really well. Um, you can cook fish on those that cooks fairly well. Um, technically you could cook some other meats on there, but boiling was probably what you did with all of your land animals. Um, if you, if you take a big piece of fatty pork and you stick it on the, on the rock and you slow cook it there. Um, it will cook and it will probably be delicious, but a bunch of that wonderful fat's gonna run off. But if it's in a pot, it's gonna simmer, all that fat's gonna stay there and you're gonna be much happier with the, the end results. Um, then you had roasting. So you have that spit and that spit, you're gonna have to hold on to one end of the, um, the entire time. So probably you were not going to slow cook your your, um, your roast using a spit. Um, more likely what you'll do is you'll take your chunk of meat, put it in the pot, bring your, bring your roast meat up to temperature um, slowly. Think, think like a sous vide. Um, and then scoop it out. There's another tool that looks like a hook on the end of a stick that it's made for grabbing stuff out of a pot. Take that out, put it on your skewer, put that skewer, um, skewer right down over the fire so it's nice and hot, sear up the outside of that, and then you have a, a perfectly cooked roast bird or chunk of meat, and it's delicious, and it's easy. Uh, it's cooked perfectly on the inside. It's nice and crispy on the outside. Um, it fits all of the tools that we're using, and you will make some Viking food that makes people super happy. Um, the stones in the barrel method of cooking would be used for really, really large dishes. Um, if it was smaller, you would cook it into a pot over a fire. Um, then you get down into the cooking methods that are really like preservation methods. So pickling was probably very popular. Um, you can pickle things in whey just as, a, as an acidic pickle. Uh, they did a lot of lacto-fermentation, so you just put things into salty water and let the, the bacteria that can live in the salty water take over, and then you can pickle most of your vegetables. Um, they fermented fish just by putting them into the ground. The, the guts of the fish have enough salt in them to get that ferment pro fermentation process going. Uh, if you were listening to the Roman presentation earlier, that's, it's super similar to um, what there are some Viking sites that they, they did with throwing stuff into a pit and just letting it ferment. Um, drying would be your other method. You would dry um, meat, you would dry fish. Um, there are some places on the Pharaoh still that do the the, the dried sheep, which you don't do anything to. You just, you, you, you cut it open and you just let it hang in the wind. And it's dry enough that it, it dries and it ferments before it rots. Um, and it's kind of interesting tasting, but um, that's, that's also a method that they probably used. Um, do we have any questions on that before we uh, get into like recipes and, and how to actually make some Viking food that's easy to make for your camp and for home and, and that sort of thing? Okay, questions include the recommended stone type. The recommended stone type would be a stone that you did not get out of a river. <laughs> um, yeah. they, they had granite. Um, 
the stone would be wherever you're at. I don't know exactly what all of the stones were made out of. Um, I know that there were some that were granite. There's probably some that are, that are sandstone. Um, I said, why not get it out? You don't get it out of a river because river rock is usually fairly porous. And if you have a little bit of water inside your, your rock, and then you take that rock and you stick it in the fire, that water will turn into steam and your rock will explode. And that sucks. And that's, that's not good food and it won't make anybody happy at all. Okay, question. Um, did they throw the fermenting fish into a dish or something and then bury it or just bury the naked fish? Um, so the fish would be, you would, you would dig a pit um, and then there would be rocks in the bottom of the pit to kind of give it something. And then you would put it in, in leather um, in skins, so kind of like, not like a leather container, but you would, you would make it so it would be, it would be a liquid resistant leather. And then you would wrap it in that, all your fish, and then cover it back up with dirt, dig it back up, open it up, and then you would have this fermented fish flop. Um, sorry. It's like, but it's all, in. but it's wrapped up in something. So it's not going to wrapped up go it's back into the, soil. the ground and then have dirt on it. No, it's, yeah. it's wrapped up in the, and they would, they would use probably leather for that. Um, seals were probably really good for that. Um, mm, yeah. They hunted the shit out of seals. Um, question dried sheep, like the traditional method of prosciutto. Um, no, like not salted. Not so. uh, they would probably also salt usually with a brine. So when you're slaughtering all of your animals, you're doing that in the, the very beginning of winter. So as soon as the, the snow falls and you no longer have easy gra um, grazing, that's when you slaughter your animals. And you would then get seawater, get it up to a boil. Um, that'll give you a decent brine. I don't know how much salinity they would take it to and then you would you would brine your meat and then just hang it from the rafters inside your house um, inside your house you always have a fire burning um, they also until late in the viking age you did not have a chimney you would just you would just have a smoke go out mostly through through the thatch if you had a or you would have a small smoke hole so when you get higher up in a in a Viking home, it's it's very smoky, um, and that's where you would you would put your meat, and then that would dry it out. Um, the salt and the and the smoke would preserve it, and it it works really really well. Um, I've done it where you you can mimic this if you have a smoker at home or like a barrel barbecuer. You just build a little tiny fire in it and just smoke your meat in there for three or four days until it dries up into this little nasty chunk of overly salty smoky meat which is not terribly good to eat but if you then cut that up throw that into a pot and boil it um, it poofs back up um, the salt goes into your broth and um, the meat is just it's incredibly tender and smoky and tastes like fantastic barbecue Oh, smoked lamb is delish. Yes, it is. Um, now the fermented lamb, if they would do it like you would do hard fisker, where you just you take the lamb, um, cut it down the down the, and open it up so that it's flat, and then you just hang the flat lamb um, in basically a, an open shack that has a has a roof so it doesn't get rain on it, and it will it will dry and ferment. And in the climate that you get in certain parts of Norway and through the Faroe Islands, um, it will dry before it, it rots in a bad way. And it's windy enough that you don't have a fly problem. Um, and so it's, it's way funkier than prosciutto. Um, if you've ever had like beef that's um, like 60 day aged beef, it's got that, it's got that funk that just, that hits. And the fermented dried lamb is, is just more of that funk. Uh, it's, 
it's one of those things that would make people say that Viking food is horrible. But if if that's what you really enjoy, it's it's delicious. Are there any other questions or? Mostly dis discussion of other kinds of rock. Yeah, no, there's there's a lot of rock and I mean, Viking research is not that hard. Um, you can you can just look at the type of rock that is in the area that you would like to portray, and that would be the the type of rock that you'd want to use. Um, rocks do a lot of different things. Um, it would not be soapstone. Soapstone was was pretty much only carved, and also it's it just it's too soft to work work like that. Um, it just it doesn't doesn't do what you want it to. Also, if you're going to be carving your own soapstone, um, there is soapstone that's around. Uh, it's got asbestos in it. Um, we're really, really good protective gear. Um, the asbestos is not going to get into your food. And once you heat it up, it starts hardening. And the more you heat it, the more times you heat it, the harder it gets. Um, soapstone just kind of, it's, it's magic that way. But when you're actually carving it, you want to wear protective equipment. Um, there was probably a lot of people who died from asbestos at the time, but they didn't know that and um, slaves were traded readily. So is there anything? No more questions, keep going. All right, so we're gonna go on to um, your recipes. Um, so yeah, let me grab some pictures too. Pictures are fun. Okay, so one of the, the most common things that was, was made were barley cakes um, or any kind of grain flatbread. Uh, the way I've been making grain flatbread after um, using urine's um, hand corn to grind grain and discovering that that sucks and it takes a whole lot of work to get any kind of flour. Um, if you use half boiled whole grain and half flour, you can make some really good barley cakes and you only have to grind half as much grain. So you, you cook up your barley and it looks like this. Um, add in your, your barley flour. And you mix that all up and you get this pretty thick dough. Um, there's, this is the only thing in this is, this particular one is, is just water and, and barley. I like to make it with, with whey and barley. It makes it a little more tender, um, but this was uh, for a feast in which some people could not have the whey. Because uh, if you're lactose intolerant, whey is your kryptonite. It is, it is all lactose all the time, so much lactose. Um, and then you form it into little balls. Oh, well, and we're gonna skip right to after we've cooked it. So these are the, the little cakes. You cook them on either a flat rock or you can cook them on, on your little frying pan. They're super easy to make. Um, and then you can serve them with, um, this is a little bit of skier uh, and then some grilled herring that's on top. Um, herring in the US is way harder to get than it should be. We have a whole bunch of herring. We use it as bait and very few people sell it in stores. So if you, if you live on the Pacific coast, you can go out and catch some herring or you can talk to some fishermen that are actually there and ask them if they can get you some herring. And you can technically use bait herring, but the standards for that are low. Um, this herring was, uh, there was herring week in the Seattle area. And so I, I bought 40 pounds of, of frozen herring and it was fantastic. Um, yeah, it's a popular sushi <laughs> fish on the West Coast. So we, oh, we can, can get, get herring. Okay, I'm in Seattle and I can't get herring to save my life um, unless they bring in a tote. Is a, you have to bring in a chunk. So are you, where, what part of West Coast are you in? Are you California? I'm, I'm in Los, 
I'm in Los Angeles and around the corner from a Korean market with a really good fish counter. And I can just walk in and get Harrington today. I am, I am jealous. In Seattle, you might try Uwajamayas. The Uwajamayas in Portland carry it. Okay. Um, I am currently in Iowa for the next six months. So I will probably not be getting a whole lot of herring. Makes me a little sad. Um, so the most popular thing and the easiest thing to make is grot um, or groat or groot. Um, depending on who I've talked to, I'm always pronouncing it wrong. Um, it's basically, it's porridge. If you tell people though you're making them porridge, they don't want to eat it. But if you tell people that you're making grot, you can run campaigns like got grot or um, I am Groot and, and people think that's hilarious and then they will eat their porridge and they'll be super happy. Um, porridge is really, really simple. Take four parts of any kind of liquid. Um, you can use whey, you can use stock, you can use water, um, you can use seawater. If you want to be super authentic, Use like one part seawater that's been boiled. Um, don't always boil your seawater. Um, one part seawater and, and three parts of, of other liquid and that gets you your, your salt content. And then one part of grain and then as many parts of other things as you would like to throw in there. Um, you can throw in some fresh fish you can throw in greens, um, you can throw in leeks, um, and then you just bring this up to a boil, um, put a lid on it, move it up on your, on your fire or turn your stove down to, to low and just let it simmer for like 45 minutes, take it back up, stir it up, and, and it's, it's delicious. Um, this particular grot on here has um, broad beans, and, and um, barley and some cat's ear. Um, cat's ear is the, the fuzzy dandelions. So there's real dandelions, which are smooth, and there's false dandelions or cat's ear, which, which are fuzzy. Um, the cat's ear holds up a lot better to boiling um, and they're really delicious. They have a lot of vitamin C, super good for you. Um, this is another grot. This is probably the most popular one that I have ever made. Um, this is a cherry grot. So it just has dry cherries that you plump back up in some whey. Um, just let them hang out for a while. Um, butter and, and barley. And it's, you serve it with a little bit of honey, not very much honey. This is much, much, much better when you make it with whey. Um, the whey just, it improves the mouth feel and just makes it amazing. So if you make your own skier, which is also really easy, especially if you have an instant pot, um, I will put up documents on the, on the Google Drive for um, how to make skier um, normally and in an instant pot and, and how to make all of these crots. Um, but this is, it's, it's cherries, it's slightly sweet because the cherries give it the sweetness of the cherry. It's got a little bit of honey, um, very little honey really. Honey was super valuable. So I try to not use as much as a lot of recreations do. And then this big blop in the middle is just skier. So it's, um, it's got a big chunk of protein in it. It's got all of your, um, your fruit and it's, it's really, really delicious. Um, this is the, that dried beef. So once you've dried your beef in your, in your rafters and it turns not good anymore, then you, you take that, that ruined beef that is too salty and too smoky and you stick it in a large pot of, this is all whey and then it's got onions in it. And then you let that simmer for about three or four hours. And that meat then goes from this dried up little thing into a, a plumped up delicious thing. And I apologize, I'm really not good at, um, my slideshow went all weird and it's not, 
it's not lining up my slides like I want, but uh, I should have put it in PowerPoint, but I'm horrible at that. Um, this is that, that meat that's just cut up into little cubes, which you can also do, and it makes it cook faster. Oh, this is the meat before it's cooked. So it's, it's pretty desiccated. Um, you can store this for virtually ever. It's, um, it's super salty. It has almost no moisture content. Um, if it had more spices and you had it in, in South Africa, it would be like biltong. Um, it's just, it's, it's dried preserved meat. And this is what it is then after you have boiled it for three hours and taken it out and you slice it up. And this particular piece used to be a brisket. Um, the smoke ring basically is all the way to the middle of the meat um, just because it was so smoky after you know three, four days. Or if you're doing it correctly, you know, a month or two in the rafters, it, it gets like that. But then it pulls all of that out when you're when you're cooking it. And, and this right here is, it's good food. Um, Viking food is really good food. Uh, you can also take Viking food fancy. So this is a, another option off of a barley cake that is made more like a Swedish pancake. This is hand ground barley flour with with eggs and whey to make a thinner batter and then cooked on your little frying pan. Um, and then rolled up, filled with, with skier and covered in cloudberries. Um, served on a fancy plate because this particular one was, was for uh, a fundraiser for the, the Nordic Heritage Museum. And, when people pay a certain amount for plates, they, they want them fancy, so we did that. Um, another thing you can do that is ridiculously easy is make yourself some Gravlax. Um, Gravlax is a, a, fer a fermented salted fish product. Um, currently Gravlax has a whole bunch of sugar in it. The Vikings would not have used a bunch of sugar it would have just been salted and then probably buried in sand um, after it's been sealed up, not just, Vikings never threw anything just in the dirt and ate dirt. Dirt is not good food. Nobody wants to eat dirt. Um, nobody just put things in dirt. So you would, you would take your salmon, this is a, this is a whole salmon, salted, um, put dill on it, wrap that up in probably birch bark, so you take a birch bark, flatten it out, fish is on the inside, tie it shut, dig a hole in your sand, put that in there, put a whole bunch of sand back on top so it pushes it, flattens it out. Um, I did this by putting it in the refrigerator, wrapping it up in plastic wrap and putting some um, weights on it, which um, is what I would recommend you would do too. It takes about a month and most of the liquid comes out the fish all cures, and then you have a really, really delicious gravlax, which is, it's like lox, but it's not, it's not sweet. It's a, it's a salted salmon and it's fantastic. Um, and that's it with, um, this is all mustard seeds and coriander seeds. And these are those, this should have been back earlier. Um, this is using um, urine's, um, wonderful fire pit it is amazing and and her little flat this is the the fry pan that you can use and this is how you would cook your your little flatbreads on the pan is that a spider with legs or just parking that on the coals um this is sitting on a spider with legs which is incorrect um the, there is no find of, of these little spiders with legs in, in the Viking area. Um, that's, that's a Roman thing. They were, and they're, they're also really, really handy. Um, in a Viking fire pit, you would probably either use rocks or you would just hold it. Um, or this was not what this frying pan was used for at all. That's, that's the other option. 
Um, but for cooking over a fire in a demo, it works really good for making your barley cakes. Uh, this is uh, this is that dried fish. So this is this is hard fisker. It's um, you get an entire cod, let it hang out. Um, it dries. It does develop an odor. And if you put it in your car and drive all the way to an event, your car will smell like fish a lot. And then you take your fish and you put it on a um, chopping block and pound the shit out of it with a hammer. Um, until it tenderizes up into this, which is roughly the consistency of wood chips. And the wood chips you can then dip in butter and just eat and chew, and it's like, like chewing gum, um, but with a more pleasant fish flavor than, than the smell. Um, you can also soak it in water, it plumps back up, and then you can put that into your porridge and you make a lovely cod porridge. I'm going to go with some questions now because I think we only have about five minutes left or so. Um, correct. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. It's twelve twenty-two on the coast, and uh, yeah. Well, mostly people were trying to spell hard fisker. Oh, it's H A R D. Yeah, let me go into chat and spell it. It isn't D. It's it's F is the, the thing. Yeah. But that's all right. What kind of salmon did you use for the Gravlax? Um, I used properly. You would use wild Atlantic salmon. Um, I mm. used wild um, um, sockeye salmon because I was in Seattle, and that was the salmon that was fresh and the best quality salmon. Use the best quality salmon you can get. Yes, can the smoked meat, the ugly stuff, can can it be eaten without cooking normally? I, um, I suppose yes. it means like jerky. Is. Yes, you can. Um, it is, it's, it's not, it is really, really salty. Um, so you're soaking it in about a 7% solution and then it's gonna soak up that and end up with about three to four percent actual salt content in your meat and then you're drying that by um, down to a third of what it used to be so you end up with something that's roughly 10 percent salt which is a really 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 salty thing to shove in your mouth and then it's been sitting in a in smoke for months um, and it really it tastes like it tastes like salty smoke Oh, yeah, I, I, I have had complaints about uh, hard fisker in hotels. Um, yeah, well, you guys, yeah. at this point, you guys can uh, ask your own questions. Yeah, yeah. We're, I, we're I, at that I, point I, in the yeah, proceedings. I, I got my chat up so I can read. Um, I will put some rest. I do not have the recipes in the Google Drive area yet. Um, I will pull them over and, and put them in there. Um, sorry, I had had a week. Um, my little sister is is in the hospital, so I... I missed out on a lot of time I thought I had. Um, the wood that I use for smoking, um, I try to use wood that would have been found um, around the Viking area. Mostly um, I go around to my neighbors who have been pruning trees and I use um, apple wood and cherry wood and, and birch trim. Um, <laughs> you don't need a whole lot because uh, you're just making a very, very tiny little fire and trying to make a lot of smoke. So just like every four hours, you're putting a little bit more in to make it extra smoky. Um, and then that, I haven't noticed a big difference in the flavor based on the smoke that I use, just because the smoke is not just adding, a it's, it's pounding the flavor into you. It's just, it's so overpowering, it just, it just tastes like smoke. But once it boils out into that broth, then it's just, that broth makes the best porridge. Put it there, it's got the meat fattiness and, and the smoke and the salt and it's, it's the best porridge ever. 
Um, I have used green twigs, but I try to get used dried ones. Um, green twigs give you that, they give you a little bit of creosote and the creosote is, is a bitter. Um, so you do not want to use two, they, they give you more smoke, but um, you get that, you get that bitterness. Um, it's also a carcinogen that we know now, but um, I would use more dry wood. Mm, yeah, I'm creosote. So yeah. also why you don't want to use a lot of pine or softwoods. Um, no, don't use don't use pine. Um, you want to use um, yeah, just stick with stick with fruit woods. Fruit woods are are safe. Um, if you're if you're wondering if you should use a wood, can you eat the thing that comes from the wood? Then yeah, it's probably a fine wood to use for smoke. If you can't eat what comes from the wood don't use that wood because it might actually have toxic chemicals in it that are going to make you sick or, or dead. Aspirin, um, so that's a very good question. That, that makes seeds, but I'm not sure, I'm not sure it counts as a fruit wood. Um, it's, it, it counts as a, as a pitchy wood that's gonna give you a lot of creosote. Mm, okay. Because um, you also don't want, you don't you don't want something that has a lot of a lot of pitch in it, um, because the the pitch is what makes out that that black nasty bitter, not delicious smoke. Um, alder works fine. Yeah, citrus woods uh, work surprisingly well. They they didn't have any citrus woods though. Well, no, but I do. But, so yeah, if you live somewhere that it does, you use that. Use what you have. Because um, really, the the smoke is not what's going to have a huge effect. One one of the things I look at when you're when you're recreating Viking food is what's your goal? Is your goal to make something that you're eating that's going to be very similar to what Vikings ate? Then you just use what you have and and make it so that your food at the end is very similar. Do you want to learn how they made the thing? Then you want to use the correct implements, but you don't necessarily need to use the same food. Um, or are you trying to throw all of that together and and see if what your plan is 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 correct? And then you have to kind of throw it all together. Okay, Marcy asks, how was Viking food influenced by all their travels? By which I suppose she means, did they bring stuff back, and did it take back in in Scandinavia itself? There is. There is not a lot of evidence that they that their trade involved bringing food back. What they did bring back is wine. Um, they they definitely brought back French wine. Um, they loved that. That was a high value food that was worth putting in your boat and taking it back. Um, there's not uh, honey too. There's evidence that they brought back honey. There's not evidence that they brought back like fruits and vegetables. Um, a, they don't travel really well, and and B, it's it's easier to bring back seeds and then plant them and then grow them. Um, spices, there is zero evidence that they brought back spices, so that gives you two options: either they just didn't see the value in in bringing spices back, or the value was in that weird middle ground where it was too valuable to waste. And so there was no waste, but it was not valuable enough to bury anyone with it. And so it didn't get into any burials. And that's a, that's a super thin line. So I usually, until we get better evidence, I'm going to say that they did not import any spices. Okay, we've uh, reached yeah. the end of our hour. All right. I'd like to thank you very much for this hour on if you uh, want Viking more, food. there's advanced Viking food um, after lunch. Okay, that will be in one half hour from now at one o'clock. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.